14, Romans 14. Reading from the King James Bible, we're going to read in unison. We're going to read one verse this morning, Romans chapter 14 and verse number 4. Romans chapter 14 and verse number 4. And let's read together out loud, shall we? Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Let's read it one more time. Romans 14, verse number 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up. For God is able to make him stand. I'm going to talk to you this morning about triple A. Accusations, accusers, and the accused. Triple A. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you again for being a wonderful God. Thank you for salvation that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, dear God, for this book. Thank you for the King James Bible. Thank you for the Word of God uh, that can save our souls. And uh, Lord, uh, teach us how to live the Christian life. I pray that you bless these dear folks for being faithful this morning. I pray that you bless them uh, with this truth this morning and help us to pay attention. Uh, Lord, help us uh, to, to block out everything else in the world that's happening today in our own lives, nationally, internationally. Uh, Lord, help us to focus on the Word of God and the sermon this morning on accusations, the accusers, and the accused. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. The Bible says in Proverbs 30, verse number 10, Accuse not a servant unto his master, lest he curse thee and thou be found guilty. Let me repeat that again. Accuse not a servant unto his master, lest he curse thee and thou be found guilty. I'm going to talk to you this morning, as I said, about accusations, accusers, and the accused. The etymology of the word accused is to call to account, make complaint against. It's containing an accusatory, containing an accusation. You know, an indictment is called an accusatory instrument. And all it is, is an accusation leveled against a defendant. That's what an indictment is. It's an accusation. There's no proof in it. It's just an accusation. The accusatory says containing an accusation of a prosecutor relating to prosecution making a complaint. Call to account making complaint against. That's what accusatory is. That's what the etymology of accused is. Well, the etymology of complaint like complaining, is this. Lamentation. We're going to read a verse in Lamentation. Wherefore should a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? Why do you complain? A person who complains is not right with God. You and I deserve hell to pay for our sins. You and I deserve to die for our sins. But yet we complain about the littlest, most stupidest things. And God's going to hold that against us. What you're, when you complain, you're accusing God of not being right. When you're, when, you're, when you're complaining, you're accusing God of your lot in life. When you're complaining, you're showing how not right with God you are. Complaint, lamentation, expression of grief. Grief, sorrow, anguish. Expression of dissatisfaction or disapproval. Statement of grievances, formal accusation, a plaintive poem to lament. That which is complained of. This is what complaint is. Bodily ailment, cause of pain or uneasiness. The etymology of complaint is to lament, bewail, grieve, find fault, express dissatisfaction, criticize. Make a formal accusation or charge to an authority to lament. Expression of suffering, grievance, blame. 
lament, utter expressions of grief or pain, emit a mournful sound. I told you before when I was a court reporter, when I first, especially when I first started out, for those of you who do not know, I retired from court reporting in Supreme Court about, I think, four years ago now that I think about it, four plus years. And I remember when I first started out, especially taking criminal cases, when the people would stand up, the, the prosecutor would stand up, and he'd level the charges in his opening statement to the court about the defendant to the jury. So he would face the jury and tell the jury what he's about to prove about this criminal, alleged criminal, the defendant. And I'd be sitting there, and this is the very beginning of my career, and I sit there, man, that defendant, man, he ought to be hung, shot. He is guilty. After the, after the people got done, I said, man, that guy is guilty over there. Prosecutor sat down, and then defense counsel stood up. And he gave his opening spiel to the jury. And I, when he was done, I sat there, and I said, man, that prosecutor's a liar. He's trying to hang this guy. That prosecutor ought to be fired. You know why? Because they're both giving their point of view of an accusation that was hurled against somebody. And you don't know whether the accusation is true or not until all the evidence comes out. One of my favorite judges to, to speak, I don't know, he's probably retired now, obviously. Judge, or, or I don't know, if, yeah, all right, let's go move, move on. So uh, Judge Sheridan used to have one of the greatest opening statements to the jury. And uh, very methodical, very slow, very meticulous. He would stand and walk behind the bench as he was talking to the jury. And I'll never forget what he said. This paper, the indictment, is nothing more than an accusatory instrument that brings this defendant to this courtroom. This is just an accusation. As the defendant sits there at his table right now, he is not guilty and he is innocent of all these charges. You must believe right now that that defendant over there is completely innocent of all the accusations on this indictment. And he'd walk back and forth. He said, if that defendant wanted to, he could sit there and, and work on the crossword puzzle and not pay attention to the court. He can sit there and doodle and draw cartoons all he wants. And you, you are not to uh, allow any, inf any negative inference against him for doing that. If he wanted to, he could put his head on the table and sleep during the entire trial, and you're not to have a negative inference against that defendant. He was charging the jury in the opening statement that this is just a piece of paper that contains accusations. You know what's sad? Christians don't follow that. Believers jump to conclusions based on an accusation of gossip and second-hand hearsay, third-hand hearsay, and they jump to a conclusion because they are an accusation about somebody without any evidence being produced. You know what he said? The defendant doesn't even have to be here. He doesn't have to be here. You know, defendants can stay in jail or prison if they want and not show up. He says, you are not to hold that against the defendant. Yeah, but he's supposed to answer for himself. Well, that would be good if he does. But you know what? I know a man that was falsely accused and falsely arrested and falsely beaten and falsely uh, whipped with a cat of nine tails had his beard pulled out, his hair pulled out. I know a man that was crucified and never one time opened his mouth to defend himself and died on the cross. And that's why we get what we have in our jurisprudence, in our law today, that you're supposed to hold the defendant completely innocent until the charge has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. It'd be good for God's people to do that, ladies and gentlemen. So this morning, I'm going to talk to you about accusations, mostly false, the accuser, and the accused this morning. The Bible is very clear that when you take vengeance against someone who's done something wrong, instead of letting God deal with it with his vengeance, God's vengeance is no longer applicable to that person who initially had done wrong. Most people jump to a false conclusion. 
without hearing both sides. And by the way, we've all been guilty of that. Every single one of us, but hopefully we learn after a number of times. But too many people are bitter, they're hateful, they're envious of others, they love money, they want to make themselves look better than others, they degrade others, they criticize others, always willing to throw someone under the bus, they take advantage of one slip up, they pile on, they kick them when they're down, they never give them the benefit of the doubt, they never say anything good about them, and they either don't realize that others see how petty and immature they are, or they just don't care if anyone knows or can see how hateful and shallow they really are. It's really sad that someone has to stoop that low to hurt someone on purpose. There must be an emptiness inside that gives these people a thrill to hurt and degrade others, either privately or in front of others. They make, it must make them feel good, but it makes them look stupid. They, make, they may make them look uh, like uh, they know what they're talking about, but to others they look immature. Over the littlest things also. They look for ways to inflict emotional hurt and pain on others. They can't wait to find something wrong with someone that somebody has done wrong and to pounce on them like the accuser of our brethren, the Bible says. The enemy of the cross, the devil himself. I always take the side of the accused. Always. Doesn't mean that they're innocent. But I have always learned that the best policy is to take the side of the accused. If they hurt someone, then you better prove to me that they hurt someone. Otherwise, I will always take the side of the accused. I don't care if I'm in the minority. There have been many occasions where, a pers where person A did something wrong to person B. Person A was wrong with what person A did to person B. Person B forgives person A. But person C is a gossiper and a backbiter and a false accuser and wants to hurt person A for other peripheral reasons. And God will punish person C greater than person A. I've heard numerous true stories where person A kills person B and the family of person B forgives person A. If the family of person B forgives person A, why would you want to intervene with your anger and hatred and get involved in destroying person A? Let the law mete out its punishment, whatever it is, right or not. I've known cases where person A, these are different person A's, obviously. I've known, a, I've known of cases where person A accuses person B of some wrongdoing or crime. Person C has no evidence other than hearsay and subjective double hearsay. Yet, Person C hates person A and is out to destroy person A's life. Person C reads about it, hears gossip about it, hears backbiting about it, hears complaining about it, hears rumors and lies about it, but yet person C makes a judgment call without any evidence of what happened and then spreads gossip and is a tattler and a busybody into other men's matters. These are false accusations and false accusers against the accused. Let me tell you something, God's people ought to grow up. You may not like everything in life, like I don't like everything in life, but the best policy is to keep your mouth shut unless you're in a position of authority to deal with the accusations. If you're not in a position of authority, you better be careful with the verse we just read in Romans chapter 14, 4, and in Proverbs. Some people have been fairly who have been falsely accused, falsely accused people they do not like, and they hate them. And that's pretty sad. You know, there's something missing inside of a, of a false accuser. Maybe they grew up and their parents were critical of everybody. Maybe they grew up in a home where everybody was accusing everybody else falsely, and they grew up with that kind of uh, 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 mental attitude. I don't know. But some people are just overly critical and overly accusatory and they just pounce on people that they don't like and on purpose criticize them and accuse them of things they have no idea of what really happened. Daniel 3.8, that, that they accused the Jews, the three Hebrew boys. You know why? Because they hated the three Hebrew boys that refused to bow their knees to rock and roll contemporary religious music to the one world government. They refused to take a shot. They refused to wear a mask. And the three Hebrew boys were put in a fiery furnace. But I got news for you. Jesus showed up with the accusers, with the accused. And Jesus was in the fire with the accused. 
As long as you know you're right, you don't have to have anything to worry about. As long as you know you're innocent, you don't have to prove it to anybody. If Jesus didn't have to prove he was innocent, why would you have to prove that you're innocent? In Matthew 12, 10, that they might accuse him. In Mark 3, 2, that they might accuse him. In Luke 6, 7, that they might find an accusation against him, against Jesus. In Luke 11, 53 and 54, the Bible says, and as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees, that's your journalists, your media, and the religious uh, leaders, the Pharisees, began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. Your best policy is to keep your mouth shut because the world's trying to entangle you in some kind of talk so they can accuse you later on. You people that get that work somewhere, I'm not talking about to welfare people now. I'm talking people who are workers and laborers, okay? People hold a full-time job. Your best buddy or your best girlfriend at work is going to turn on you in two or three years and tell everybody else what you told them in secret. And the best thing you do is you keep your mouth shut to everybody. I don't care if it's your best co-worker. I don't care if it's your, your favorite co-worker. I don't care if you think they trust you and you trust them. Your best policy is to keep your mouth shut because I'm telling you, I've been in the workplace where I've seen these people change best buddies and best friends every two or three years, ladies and gentlemen. And then they falsely accuse everybody else. Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Hey, if you falsely accuse somebody, you ought to make it right, ladies and gentlemen. You ought, Zacchaeus did, you know what he did? When he got saved. When he got the whole Spirit of God in him, he made it right. I would hate to falsely accuse anyone of doing something they didn't do. I don't know how you can live with that. I don't know how you can sleep with a, with a guilty conscience knowing that you lied about somebody, knowing that you threw somebody under the bus. That's why, by, that's why people can't sleep at night. That's why they take drugs. That's why they pop pills. I don't care if it's prescribed medication or off the street uh, pharmacy. The, the street corner pharmacy, you know what I'm talking about. People can't get to sleep because they have a guilty conscience. They've lied so much and falsely accused people of so much. They're a bunch of liars. Hatred in the house of God, the Bible says. They do it against each other, brethren and sisters. In the house of God, you wonder why we don't have revival. Because people, God's people are a bunch of liars. I didn't say everyone. I put a post up and said, Americans are stupid. Some guy says, are you an American? I said, yeah, you're calling yourself stupid? I said, go to English 101, please. I didn't put the word A-L-L -L in there that said all Americans are stupid. But Americans are stupid. And God's people are stupid. When he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. The chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing. The whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. He answered him, Nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one, of, one that perverted the people. And behold, I having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof ye accuse him. But they still condemned him and crucified him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? Take your Bible, turn to John chapter number 5, please. The Gospel of John chapter number 5. John chapter number 5. Let me just say this about accusations, accusers, and the accused. The person that you hate and that you don't like, that you falsely accuse, first of all, you don't know if they got right with God or not the next time you see them. And if you've been falsely accused, 
by an accuser, you don't know if that false accuser got right with God when you meet him the next time. And a lot of times, people have a grudge against their brother or their sister or their neighbor or co-worker without knowing or thinking that, you know what, maybe God's working on their heart. And maybe the next time I see them, they're going to be right with God. But people hold a grudge falsely, accusing them in their heart, not knowing if God did a work in their heart or not. We have such thing in this nation called jury nullification. For those of you who do not know what that, that is, jury nullification is when a jury hears the entire case of a defendant and sees the evidence that beyond a shadow of a doubt, or beyond a reasonable doubt, depending on what state you're in, but beyond a reasonable doubt in New York, that this defendant is guilty. Jury nullification says, we don't even care if he's guilty, we're going to find him not guilty. The jury has the power to do that. Sometimes it works out good, sometimes it doesn't work out good. I was working in the Bronx 30-some years ago. The Bronx has the highest jury awards in the country. And they would stand up in front of a jury and they say, we deserve this. We. The black lawyer would stand up in front of a black jury and say, we deserve this when a child got hurt on a school playground or some company uh, or some worker at a company did something uh, that hurt somebody. And then you wonder why all the companies and businesses are leaving the Bronx. The Bronx has the high, had the highest awards of a jury in the nation. So that jury nullified Whatever the evidence was, say, you know what, we're going to award him $100,000. We're going to award him a million dollars. And I can tell you story after story where the evidence was crystal clear. I'm going to say something tonight. Uh, but it was crystal, crystal clear the guy was lying, but they still gave him some money. That's what you call jury nullification. And jury nullification can work good in an area, in an area where the people say, we don't care what the law is, we don't care what the charges are, we're going to find this person innocent or not guilty at least. That's called jury nullification. John chapter number 5, verse number 45. John 5, verse number 45. Jesus talking to the Jews. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. Jesus saying this. You know, a lot of people think that Jesus is going to accuse people before God. No. You know what he says? There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. These Jews, these Pharisees, they say they believe in Moses. They say they believe in the Old Testament, but they're liars. And you know what Jesus said? I'm not even going to accuse you. I'm going to let the law of God do that. I'm going to let Moses, that you say that you believe. Because he said, if you believe Moses, you would have believed me. But obviously they didn't really believe Moses because they didn't believe Jesus either. Another person was falsely accused, the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul took a different course or a different avenue uh, of uh, rebuttal than Jesus did. And for whatever reason, I'm not going to get into all the reasons this morning, but the Apostle Paul stood firm and gave his answer to his false accusers. If you were to read Acts 22 all the way to Acts 28, we don't have time to read it all, but I'm going to read snippets of it here. It says... Paul said, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? They didn't realize he was a Roman. On the morrow, in chapter 22, verse number 38, verse number 30, on the morrow, because he would have known the certainty whereof he was accused of the Jews. He wanted to know the certainty of what he was accused of the Jews. I want to know for sure. Bring some evidence, prove your case before you accuse somebody. The best, the best policy is you don't take anybody's word at face value. You have both people in, in, in your presence. Because anybody can say anything they want without the other person being there. The best policy is have both people sitting there in front of you and let them discuss the issue in front of you. In Acts 23, verse number 35, I will hear thee, said he, when thine accusers are also come. When it was told me how that the Jews had laid wait for the man, I sent straightway to thee and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him. In Acts 23, verse 28, 29. And when I would have known the cause, wherefore they accused him. 
I brought them forth into their council, whom I perceived to be accused of questions of their law, but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or bonds. In Acts 24, Tertullus began to accuse Paul. In verse number 8, commanding his accuser to come unto thee. Verse number 9, and the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. In verse number 13, Paul said, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. Paul said, prove it. You can't prove anything. In Acts 25, the Bible says when he was come, uh, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I offended anything at all. But Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem, and there be judge of these things before me? Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender, or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. Then Festus got together with King Agrippa and his wife Bernice. And he, said, and he said to King Agrippa, when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have judgment against him. To whom I answered, it is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that he which is accused have the accusers face to face. And have license to answer for himself concerning the crime against him. You know what said? That the unsaved Romans had better respect and dignity for people than God's people do. Face to face. Of course, you don't do that. Now you know what happened in, in, in court? They have TV monitors. Oh, I can't be in his presence. He, he's he's uh, threatening to me. And, and I can't think straight when he's in the same. So you know what? You can be in another room right now with a TV monitor coming into the courtroom instead of being face to face. He's going to intimidate me. I'm too afraid to speak in his presence. Yeah, you're a liar. They're liars. If you have the truth, you shouldn't be afraid to speak the truth, especially when you're confronted in a court of law. It is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that he which is accused have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. In verse number, 19, uh, verse number 18, against whom when the accusers stood up, they brought none accusation of such things as I supposed, but had certain question against him of their own superstition and of one Jesus, which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And that's why they falsely accuse you, because they hate Jesus, man. They hate God. They hate the Bible. And they falsely accuse people who hate God. Uh, they falsely accuse people who love God and love the Bible. All the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself had appealed to, to Augustus, I have determined to send him. Verse 27, For it seemeth to me unreasonable to send a prisoner, and not withal to signify the crimes laid against him. And then when Paul spoke to Agrippa in Acts 26, he said, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. Can you imagine? You have no idea for how many, for how many things our church has been accused of for 35 years, man. You, you, well, there's a litany list. You know what? I, if I told you some of the, some of the things, you, you would probably laugh and say, I don't believe it. We've been maligned, falsely accused about different things. But I'm here Sunday morning, Sunday night and Wednesday and I can answer anybody's question, anybody that has a question of me. I come in church in and out, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. People have asked me outside. People have asked me inside. You can ask me any question you want about anything. But you know what? People don't want to confront truth. They just want to malign people and falsely accuse people because they hate the truth. I told you I have six answers to every question. For those of you who are new, you not have been here long enough, I have six answers to every single question. One of them usually applies to your question. Yes, no, maybe, I don't know, I don't care, and it's none of your business. 
One of those six answers will apply to just about every question I'm ever asked. 1 Timothy 5.19 says, Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Take your Bible, turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. And we're living in perilous times. We're living in the end days. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. They love themselves, but they don't love God. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Verse number three, without natural affection. Those are homosexuals, you're perverts, okay? It's, it, they're abomination, the Bible says, Amen. You, the world wants to make you think that they're normal. And a homosexual is a pervert. It's an abomination. Without natural affection, truth breakers, watch this, false accusers, incontinent, you can't control yourself, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness. Oh, they're religious. You know, they come to church, they sing religious songs, you know, they proclaim that they're a child of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Hey, are you a false accuser? Huh? Do you lie about people? Do you criticize people? How come you don't criticize the Pope? Why don't you criticize the Pope to your Catholic family and friends? Why would you want to pick on some sinner or some, hey, you remember the woman caught in adultery? Huh? Jesus stooped down the ground and wrote, as if he didn't hear the accusers, it says. And then when he looked up, there's nobody there except the woman and him. He says, woman, where are those thine accusers? She said, no man, or something like that. He said, this, you know what he said? Neither do I accuse thee, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Instead of picking on sinners, why don't you pick, up, pick on the Pope? Why don't you pick on somebody, uh, the, relig the religious false leaders? Why don't you pick on the political false leaders and those people instead of your neighbor, your co-worker, or a church person? You're shallow and immature. That's why. You're a false accuser and you have a wrong target. In Titus chapter number 2, the Bible says the aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers. Not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. It's not just the keepers at home that's, bla the, that's not blaspheming God. It's the false accusers that are blaspheming God also. So you think, you, you do like three out of five, but how about the other parts? And with your mouth and your tongue, you're falsely accusing brethren and sisters and church people who are struggling in their sin, struggling with a problem, struggling with their past, and you just heap more on them. You just want to step on them when they're down. That's a false accuser, man. How come you don't go to someone and say, hey, is there anything I can do to help? Hey, I, I noticed you got, maybe you might have a problem. Is there anything I can do to help? Let me know. I'm available. Hey, why don't you do that instead of being critical of somebody, about somebody? Instead of falsely accusing somebody, you have no idea what they're going through. Let me tell you something. You don't know what goes on inside a home either. You don't know why a man is not right all the time because he may be living with a, with a Jezebel. And you may not know why the wife is not right because she may be living with a Nabal. And before you jump to a false conclusion why somebody acts the way they act, maybe you don't know what's going on inside the home, you false accuser. Why don't you give people the benefit of the doubt and give them some leeway and be patient and ask God to bless them and try to help them if they can, if you can. I'm not God, you're not God, stop playing God. Take your Bible, turn to 1 Peter, chapter number 3. 1 Peter, chapter number 3. To 
too many God's people are, are busy bodies, false accusers, sticking their nose into somebody else's business. You have no business doing that. 1 Peter chapter number 3. First Peter chapter number 3, starting in verse number 15. We'll pick it up when he's just done talking about uh, Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. And in verse number 15, he said, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. The word conversation, I have to keep reminding you this, in 1611, when the King James Bible was written, the word conversation doesn't mean just your talk, it means your conduct. So when you see the word conversation in the Bible, it's not limiting to just your talk, conversation like we use it today. It talks about your total conduct. So if you read that in mind, it says that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ, for it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Look at 2 Peter chapter number 2. 2 Peter chapter number 2. And Lot suffered for his sin. 2 Peter chapter number 2. Well, are you upset that God hasn't made you a preacher? Are you upset that God hasn't made you in some kind of authority position where you can preach and teach and then you, for some reason, you sit at a keyboard in front of a, a, in front of a monitor at a home and you're either on social media, fake book or whatever it is and you think that God's made you a man of God, a preacher to sit there and falsely accuse anybody that you don't like. God's going to hold you in judgment, ladies and gentlemen. God's going to hold you accountable to the judgment seat. Every word that comes out of your mouth, every word that's printed from your from your, your Jezebel fingernails, you're going to give account of to God Almighty. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's why they hate preachers today, man. They hate preachers. Baptist preachers. Old-fashioned preachers. Hellfire and damnation preachers. That's why they're calling this hate speech. Let me tell you something. Every single murder is a hate crime. How in the world can some government official say, well, this is a hate crime. Every crime is a hate crime. When you steal something, that's hate. When you hit somebody, assault somebody, that's hate. When you kill somebody or murder somebody, that's hate. But then the government's going to decide, this is really a hate crime. Okay. And then you swallow that hook, line, hook, line, and sinker, and you believe it. Every crime is a hate crime, ladies and gentlemen. Not just the ones that government says they are. Second Peter, chapter number 2, verse number 9. Watch this. You need to read this, man. Oh, this is the one right after a lot. I apologize. 2 Peter chapter number 2, verse starting at verse number 9. This is after he talks about Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord knoweth, verse number 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government. And despise government. Now I'm with Thomas Jefferson, the smallest government possible is the best government. But you better be careful, you don't cross a line where God's going to hold you accountable because you despise the government that the idiots in our nation voted for. And God's going to hold you accountable because there's a lot of things we can say rightfully accuse President Biden about. But there's some things we can rightfully criticize President Trump about. And there's some things you can rightly criticize Bill Clinton about and Jimmy Carter about and Ronald Reagan about. But you better be careful that you don't despise government. I agree it's out of control. I know that. I agree it's too big. I agree with that. But when you get, you're not going to like the government that Jesus is going to rule in heaven. You don't like that order. Look, look what he says. Keep reading here. That despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Uh, if you were here in the old Bible study, uh, I went right up to uh, Paul Tonka, the congressman, and I face to face. I asked him questions, point blank. You know what you do? You falsely accuse him and falsely criticize him. You're not willing to f to to face him face to face and ask him pointed questions. 
So you'll sit there on social media on your, on your iPhone or your, 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 your laptop or your, your uh, whatever wireless device you have, and you'll spew out a whole bunch of things. Why don't you go to the person in, in person and talk to them? If you don't like something, write them a letter. But too many times, too many of God's people falsely accuse too many people of doing something that they didn't do. You ought to be careful. God's going to hold you accountable. Verse number 11. Whereas angels, which are greater in power, and might bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that counted pleasure to riot in the daytime spots they are and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices cursed children which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam the son of Bosar who loved the wages of unrighteousness but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumbass speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. That's who you're following. You know, when Jesus told Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, Peter didn't know that he was following Satan's advice and counsel when he was rebuking Jesus. And a lot of times God's people don't realize, they think that they have this self-righteous indignation, you know, like their self-righteous anger. The, one of the best things you do is you pray for people, man. One of the best things you do, you'll love people and, and try to help them if, they, if you can. But in your self-righteousness, you feel indignant against certain people that you don't like, and you just spew a lot of things out of your mouth. If you prayed for somebody 5 o'clock in the morning, you would be criticizing them at 12 noon. If you, if you were praying for them every single day this week, you wouldn't be criticizing them at work. Jude, the book right before Revelation, second to the last book in the Bible, Jude, verse number 8. For envy, for love of money, you don't like that they have more money, you don't like that they're either good looking, beautiful, handsome, articulate, intelligent. You're jealous or envious of what they can do. And so you falsely accuse somebody because you're so shallow. Yeah. Jude, verse number 8. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. Despise dominion. Those are people over you, authority. And speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. I mean, the angels who are greater than us, they don't even accuse people, and they're right. You don't even know if you're right, and you still falsely accuse people. Verse 10. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts... In those things, they corrupt themselves. When you falsely accuse someone of something they didn't do, God's going to hold, God's cursing you, God's going to judge you, and God's going to hold you accountable, man. And it'll be worth, worse for you than the person you're falsely accusing. Revelation 12, 10, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. One day, the accuser of our brethren is going to be burning in the lake of fire. The same person who went to God and accused Job, a righteous man. The same devil who went to God before God said, man, Job just loves you because the way you bless him, look what you've given to him. You take everything away from him, I promise you, I'll tell you, he's going to curse you to, his face, to your face. You know what he was? He was a false accuser of the brethren. The Bible says he does it day and night. 
And there's too many people caught up on social media that are falsely accusing other people. They, you know what? They may, have, they may be guilty, but you don't have the evidence to prove it. You don't know that. I don't know that. The best policy is just to keep your mouth shut until the evidence comes out. Numbers 11, 1. When the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it. And his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. Psalm 77, 3. I complained, and my spirit was overwhelmed. Job 7.11, I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Take your Bible, turn to Psalm 144, please. Lamentations 3.39, the Bible says, Wherefore doth a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? Lamentations 3.39, wherefore, that means why. Wherefore doth a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? Why is this happening to me, Pastor? Because we're sinners, that's why. Because we deserve God's punishment. We, we deserve God's judgment. And when you take it out on somebody else, God's going to hold you even worse accountable. Psalm 144, verse number 14. That our oxen be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in, nor going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. Everybody's complaining in America. Hey, if you don't like it, vote, for, vote them out. You have no right to complain if you're not voting. I don't believe in voting. You're stupid and you're an idiot. You're an idiot. Well, they're both corrupt. Yeah, that's true, but you ought to vote. Amen. Then you complain that your tax is too high. Then you complain they're taking my guns away. Then you're complaining uh, th that these people are killing babies. Well, vote. D don't complain. Don't complain. In Jude, verse 16. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts in their mouth, speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Job 23, verse 2, even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Psalm 55, verse 2, attend unto me and hear me. I mourn in my complaint and make a noise. Psalm 102, 1, hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Psalm 142, verse 2, I poured out my complaint before him. I showed him before him. I showed before him my trouble. If you're going to complain, why don't you tell God about it, amen? If you got something about somebody, why don't you ask God about it, amen? Complain about your boss. You claim, claim, complain about your coworker. You complain about your employee. You complain about everything and everybody. Sign the girl up, ladies and gentlemen. Stop complaining. Stop falsely accusing people that you have no business accusing. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Accuse not a servant unto his master lest he curse thee and thou be found guilty. Let's all stand. Dear Heavenly Father, if anything, we ought to pray and love people that falsely accuse others because there's something desperately missing in their heart. For people that stoop so low to be constantly criticizing an individual constantly, never having anything good to say about somebody, never apologizing, never trying to make it right, never esteeming others better than themselves. Oh, dear God, I pray, dear God, that we would pray for the false accusers because obviously there's something missing in their heart. There's a vacuum, there's a void of the love of God. The mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, the long-suffering of God, the grace of God. There's so much missing in a person who's a false accuser to God that they need our prayer. They need somebody that will love them and be patient with them and show them the love of God. And dear God, I pray this morning, I pray if anybody in this room has ever falsely accused someone else 
Oh, dear God, like Zacchaeus, I pray that we would make it right. I don't know how people can sleep with a conscience, with a guilty conscience, knowing that they've hurt somebody, knowing that they hurt somebody physically, emotionally, they lied about somebody. I don't know how they can do that without getting it right with thee and them. Dear God, please bless these dear folks. I pray that you bless this sermon. And there's so many things, Lord, that we want to talk about internationally, nationally, locally. But what we ought to talk about is our heart and our mind and not accuse others falsely. Bless the invitation. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Whatever.